Hey, good. Hey, so, hey, welcome. Um, we'll try this Zoom presentation and see what happens. Uh, part of the difficulty, I think, unfortunately, Zoom works really well to do presentations, but I can't really see what the learners are picking up or what they're not picking up. And so we lose the ability to do feedback. And I, I think that's part of teaching. So that's a bit frustrating. Um, and I think there's the ability if there are questions that people can kind of speak up if they unmute their settings. And so as I'm running through this and we'll share a lot of information very quickly. And so if you have questions or say, what is he trying to teach us here? Uh, certainly feel free to stop us. So we always like to start with a definition. Hey, you Dr. Know, uh, Oracle. Yeah. Uh, we'll also try to keep an eye on the chat box and let you know if any questions drop in there. That way you can just stay focused on your pre presentation. Ah, okay. All right. Sounds good. So people can put things in the chat box. That sounds like a great idea. So we'll start with the definition. It's interesting. Um, people often refer, you know, as you're wandering around the wards and rounding with the lung doctors, they'll talk about something called the gold guidelines. And we'll talk about the gold guidelines here in a few minutes. But the most recent definition of COPD is this. They say it's a common preventable and treatable disease. And so the idea, sometimes we're kind of therapeutic nihilists and say, oh, the patient has COPD, there's nothing to be done. And so the current, guy, the current definition says, yes, it's common, it's preventable, and it actually is treatable. And it's characterized by respiratory symptoms, things like coughing and wheezing and shortness of breath. Certainly the definition involves airflow limitation. So again, air doesn't empty from the chest the way it's supposed to. And then, the airflow limitation is because the airways are involved and the alveolar walls are involved. And it's usually caused by exposure to noxious particles or gases. And in this country, that means cigarette smoking. The new definition adds respiratory symptoms. The older definitions didn't really talk that much about symptoms. And the older definitions talked about that this is often a progressive disease, and it is. And that's been eliminated from the current definition. And the older definition talked about chronic inflammation in the airway, and they're kind of getting away from discussing inflammation, except now talking a little bit about eosinophilia, because that may change what kind of medications you want to use as part of the initial management of the COPD. And they also mentioned that, uh, you know, exacerbations and comorbidities, the older definitions mention that, the new definition kind of falls away from that. So why do we want to talk about COPD? It's a common problem, around 20 million in the U.S. with COPD, and it's expensive process, maybe $30 billion of direct cost, maybe indirect cost, another 20 billion. It's the third or fourth leading cause of death in the U.S., depending on which study you look at behind heart disease and cancer. And the mortality is significant 10 years after diagnosis in the range of 50% mortality. And in fact, on average, more people die from COPD than diabetes or breast cancer. Until relatively recently, if you watch TV advertisements, you heard a lot about cancer, you heard about a lot of diabetes, didn't talk much about COPD, but now more with direct-to-consumer advertising, you're hearing about drugs like Anoro and Stialto and Spiriva. And so people are starting to hear more about COPD on television and becoming more aware of it, I think. This is a really old slide, but I leave it in my teaching deck because I think it's an interesting thing. And I'm not sure, can you see my pointer on the screen? Does that cross over? Yes, okay. So again, this is an old slide, but this was over a 30 year interval looking at things like what happened to the death rate for, for coronary disease, it went down, for stroke went down, other cardiovascular disease went down. That for a long time, the death rate from COPD was significantly increasing. Now, it started to fall off now. Uh, but the point is COPD is, is still a common cause of death in the U.S. So what risk factors? In this country, 80-90% of the risk is COPD. And so we know that people who smoke have a higher rate of decline of the FEV1. All of us after the age of about 25 or 30, the amount of air you empty in the first second falls down. So that's kind of the way we're put together. Things get worse with time. But people who are smokers get uh, an accelerated rate of fall in FEV1, things like the age of starting, the pack years, whether they continue to smoke, all those things are predictive of mortality. But the sensitivity varies. And so it's not uncommon. I'll see people who are 70 year old pack, or pack a day smoker in the office and they may really have pretty good lung function, surprisingly good. And then you'll see people who are in their late 30s, early 40s who have smoked some, but they have really pretty terrible COPD. So the general thought is maybe 20 to 30% of smokers develop clinically significant COPD, but uh, some time ago there was a study from Northern Sweden that suggested as many as 50%. So I guess the bottom line is if you're gonna be a smoker, don't move to Northern Sweden, it's more dangerous for you. 
So in not only cigarette smoking, but things like pipes and cigars and water pipes and marijuana also increase the risk. And then there's always this concern about what about passive smoking? And we know that children of smokers have increased respiratory symptoms like coughing and wheezing, and they have reduced pulmonary function. What does smoking do to the lung? Well, the lung tries to protect itself. The mucus glands get hypertrophied. You make more mucus. The cilia don't work the way they should. The macrophages don't gobble up and kill things the way they're supposed to. There's increased amount of inflammatory cells in the lower airway. So when we do lavage or wash fluid in and out of the lung for people who are smokers, we'll find increased number of inflammatory cells like neutrophils. And then this alkaline intertrypsin, which is supposed to protect the lung from damage, uh, doesn't work as well in the setting of smoke exposure. Uh, there are some other factors as well. So there's a uh, group of enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases. Those probably play a role in spread of cancer, but they can also play a role in uh, COPD. Uh, the matrix metalloproteinases degrade proteins like collagen. And people who smoke who have COPD actually have more matrix metalloproteinase in the sputum than those who don't develop COPD. There have been some interesting studies in mice and people, mice who don't have matrix metalloproteinase are actually protected from developing emphysema when you expose them to cigarette smoke. What about air pollution? Well, people talk about air pollution. Fortunately, it's not a big problem in this country, but in other countries of the world, that's a big deal. And then biomass fuels, indoor cooking, not a concern in this country, but other countries, it's a, it's a significant concern. And occupational exposure, it's not uncommon. You'll see a two-pack-a-day smoker in their 60s, and they say, well, they've got COPD because they work at the local factory. Well, certainly there are some things you can get exposed to in the factory that can affect your lung function, but most of what we see is really more related to cigarette smoke. There's an old thing called the DEFT hypothesis that people who have hyperactive airways are at increased risk. Gender, racial, socioeconomic status play a role as well. So last year, my youngest son and I had a chance to spend a, a couple weeks in Kenya working for a Samaritan's first hospital over there. And again, in this country, we don't see indoor cooking, but there, this is the hospital um, kitchen. Uh, and they were basically cooking in these huge pots. Here we are standing beside these huge pots with wood uh, burning um, heat, basically. Now, the kitchen was pretty well ventilated. They had all these uh, exhaust pipes set up. Um, but in addition to those big pots that they were cooking under, they also had actually open fires that they were cooking on in this kitchen. So when we walked in, there were some guys cutting up uh, bananas and carrots, and they were just in there cooking. And in fact, we saw some people with pretty significant obstructive lung disease there who had never been smokers. Uh, one guy in particular, I remember, owned a restaurant and did all his cooking in the back room with no windows and, and really had severe COPD, even though he'd never been a smoker. But that's not something you'll typically see in this country. Genetic factors are something we think about. It's interesting from the physiology or understanding how you get COPD to talk about alpha-1 and a trypsin, uh, but it accounts for less than 1% of the COPD in the U.S. Uh, it's certainly important to think about that because you can replace alpha-1 and trypsin, but again, the majority of COPD is not related to that. Matrix metalloproteinase may play a role, as we talked about. There's some other enzymes that may play a role. And there's some thought now about also maybe people who are smokers that get COPD had smaller lungs to begin with. And some interesting studies to suggest smaller lungs to start out and maybe an accelerated loss of lung function over time may play a role. Um, oxidative stress certainly plays a role from cigarette smoke. So we know that, again, people who smoke will activate the macrophages and activate neutrophils in the lower respiratory tract maybe premature death of endothelial and epithelial cells, maybe viral infection, and again, maybe this impaired lung function or uh, development plays a role. Cytotoxic T cells may exacerbate the injury, um, and there are some inflammatory mediators, and then you can get some parabronchial and interstitial fibrosis, and all those things play a role. So what happens from the pathophysiology standpoint, again, the the uh, hallmark is going to be airflow limitation and typically gas trapping. So you can get inflammation in the airways, some swelling in the airways, so the airways don't empty as well as they should. You can get mucus plugging, elastic recoil decreases, and then because of destruction of alveolar walls, the alveolar attachments are destroyed. And again, the lung is not, or the airways are not tethered open the way they should be. That leads to abnormal gas exchange. Uh, and you know some patients with pretty advanced COPD have remarkably good blood gases. Others will get hypercarbia and hypoxemia. Uh, 
you get increased amounts of mucus. So we'll see people uh, who get hospitalized intermittently, just their airways get all plugged up. And sometimes they'll actually do therapeutic bronchoscopy to try to clean the lung out because the lungs are just so plugged up with thick mucus. And then eventually you can get pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lungs. And um, it requires a lot of destruction of uh, vessels to be able to get that, or you can get vasospasm as well. In fact, interestingly, a few years ago, there was a study looking at the size of the pulmonary artery on a CT scan and suggesting those who had bigger pulmonary arteries were at increased risk for exacerbations. One of the things we're concerned about is trying to prevent exacerbations, and typically it's a viral or bacterial infection or sometimes an environmental irritant. But it's important to think about COPD as more than just a lung disease. You know, we focus on the lungs, but actually people who have COPD have some systemic features to think about as well. So they're increased risk for heart disease. They can get osteoporosis, anemia, metabolic syndrome, or sometimes weight loss, can't gain weight. Obviously, increased risk for lung cancer because of the smoking, depression, and anxiety, and all those issues may, again, contribute to their um, decreased function, the setting of COPD. And in fact, there have been some work suggesting that patients with COPD get a skeletal muscle myopathy. You can see that also with heart disease and kidney disease, but that may be one of the limiting factors for exercise, though, and it's more than just air flow limitation. It may be that the peripheral muscles aren't working as well as they should either. And then certainly sleep disordered breathing. You know, we see a lot of sleep apnea in the setting of patients who have COPD, especially those who are heavy. So uh, smokers who have COPD are more than two times at risk for cardiovascular disease compared to smokers who don't have COPD. Interesting. And then there was a lung health study published several years ago. We'll talk about some of the findings from that. But cardiovascular disease was the second leading cause of death in that particular study. And we already mentioned they can get skeletal muscle dysfunction or weight loss, anemia, osteoporosis, depression. So again, it's about more than just the lungs. You have to think about it as the systemic disease. So the goal guidelines were actually published years ago, first published about 20 years ago, and they've been updated intermittently. Again, they got, the definition has been changed several times. The recommendations have been kind of tweaked. Uh, the uh, reason or the ways of classifying COPD have been tweaked a little bit. And the most recent guidelines talk about adding eosinophils. And so looking for uh, eosinophilia on a CBC to decide if you're going to use a long-acting beta agonist and inhaled steroid versus a long-acting muscular uh, antagonist and a, a LABA or LAMA-LABA combination. Now, back in the old days, we'd round on the ward with little handbooks in our pockets. And some of you are old enough to remember that. And I remember when I was an intern, I always carried the Washington Manual in my pocket. It's kind of what we did. The pocket guide for COPD is 62 pages, so I would not recommend that you print that out and stick it in your pocket. You can access that on your phone in more than 300 references. That's the summary. So there's a lot of information presented in the COPD guidelines is the point. So I would not try to read all the guidelines, but probably looking at the summary is not a bad idea at some point. It is clearly a multinational effort, so there's a list of some of the countries involved in the COPD or gold guidelines. Uh, History-wise, you're looking for things like cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, what kind of risk factors, what kind of things have been exposed to. Pulmonary functions are typically going to go show airflow limitation. That's kind of how we define the illness, and you'll see air trapping. If you have emphysema or destruction of alveolar tissue, you'll see a low diffusing capacity. So diffusing capacity assesses the function of the alveolar capillary membrane. So if you're destroying alveolar capillary membrane with emphysema, the diffusing capacity is low. And there may be reversibility with a bronchodilator, may not, and they may desaturate with exercise. And that's one of the things we'll look for in the office. We chase people down the hallway with an oximeter to say, does their oxygen level drop? Exam-wise, if they've got severe COPD, they're going to be using accessory muscles. Uh, in the hospital, you see people kind of crouched on the side of the bed and bracing themselves on the elbow on their bedside stand because they're so short of breath. So if they're lying comfortably when you walk in the room, you can pretty well guess that their lungs are not that bad. Clubbing, I would make the teaching point that clubbing is unusual with COPD alone. So when you walk in and see a smoker with clubbing, the first thing you think about would be cancer. It could also be fibrosis or bronchiectasis. Uh, sometimes you'll see that on a family basis. I've seen patients in the office who had clubbing, and then you walk around and their sister has clubbing as well, and it just runs in the family. So um, chest X-ray can show hyperinflation. We'll show some X-rays here. You'll look at things like generous pulmonary arteries, increased AP diameter, flattened diaphragms. Again, we can look for exercise saturation with oximeter, look for polycythemia, or mentioned sometimes a bit anemia. EKG, some social changes. But 
the bottom line is you're eventually going to do spirometry and rather than guess and say, oh, this is a smoker who's having shortness of breath, they must have COPD. Or we'll see people who get referred over who just have shortness of breath and somebody says, oh, you have COPD. So it's not uncommon. I see people who have chronic uncontrolled asthma. They've got permanent air limitation. They get tagged as COPD and that's frustrating. Patients say, I've never been a smoker. I say, well, I, I actually don't think you have COPD. It's a different illness. But spirometry, the full volume curve or the volume time curve normally is a very steep. Uh, this is volume on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. So there's a very normal, a steep outflow. And then it plateaus usually within the first few seconds and you don't get much more air out. Somebody who has a restrictive lung disease, the curve looks normal. These pink dots are this particular machine are the predicted values. So restrictive curve looks normal. It's just smaller than it should be. And the obstructive curve is very much flattened. So the slope of volume versus time is flow. So here the slope is flattened out. So again, it's going to be less flow. And here, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 seconds, there's still airflow. So again, airflow is lower than what it should be. Here is the predicted value up here. This person's FEV1 is only what, 600 cc's as opposed to this person who has an FEV1 of about just under uh, five or just under five liters. That's my curve actually from several years ago. So my lung function at baseline is higher than predicted and that doesn't, it's not because I exercise, my lungs are a little bigger than some. Um, I suppose I should repeat, but this was such a good value. I just quit testing myself after that test. I'd done well. This is the full volume loop. Uh, again, this is my curve, a normal looking curve, a very steep, increase to a peak flow and then a very linear decline where you get down to zero. So the things that determine airflow are elastic recoil and airways resistance, neither of which you can change with effort. So once you get to a certain amount of effort, even if I blow out harder, my curve is going to look like this. Submaximal effort will look different, but a maximal, I mean, once you get to a certain level of effort, the curves all will look the same. So this is somebody with restrictive lung disease. And again, on this curve, the Flow is on the vertical axis. The volume is on the horizontal axis. Here's the predicted volume. You can see the measured volume is lower than it should be, but the peak flow is actually pretty good here. So that's a classic restrictive disease. This is somebody who has obstructive lung disease, and it's very scooped out at any given time or any given volume here. The flow should be up here, and it's down near the horizontal axis. So again, that shows you that the airflow is much lower than it should be. So that's the classic obstructive lung disease pattern where you have this scooped out pattern on the flow volume loop. You'll see it sooner on the flow volume loop than you will on the volume time curve, and that's why we like to do both when we're doing lung function testing. So this is somebody from the teaching file from several years ago. Actually, it's a gentleman I saw who was 70 years old. He was a feed salesman. He couldn't figure out why he couldn't load bags of feed into his pickup truck anymore. He'd had a heart attack, actually, and some of that could be heart disease. But when he did his lung function testing, his bladder capacity is a little over half what it should be. But look at his FED1. It's 18% of predicted. And we generally count anything less than 30% of predicted as being very severe. So he has extremely severe air limitation. Look at his flow volume loop. Most of his volume is at almost zero flow. He has a little ditzel to begin with. And then for most of his exhaled volume here, his flow is very, very poor. And look how flat his curve is here. Here at 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14 seconds, he's still breathing out because his airflow is extremely poor. So he does have heart disease, but he's probably going to be very limited by this severe COPD, um, not going to be able to be very active. And, you know, we sometimes will make the mistake of saying, oh, you've got terrible lung disease, you're going to die tomorrow, the next day, or maybe next week, you're not going to live very long. So this is another person from my teaching file. He was hospitalized. This is an older curve, but he'd, he'd gone more than 10 years after his initial hospitalization. Look at his obstructive lung disease. His vital capacity was only 40% of predicted. His FEV1 is 16%. Uh, and you say, well, how low can somebody go? I have a number of people in my office that are ranged from 12 to 16%. Again, less than 30% is going to be pretty bad. And there aren't a lot of people running around like that. I had one gentleman who was at 7%. We didn't believe it, so we repeated it, and we got a 7% again. But that's extremely unusual. Once you get less than 20%, most people just don't have enough lung to get by, and they'll end up uh, passing away. But this guy lived more than 10 years after this initial hospitalization with respiratory failure with an FEV1 that was dismal. So the point is, it's a little hard to predict the outcome based on the severity of air flow limitation. You have to look at other things like frequency of exacerbation and comorbidities as well.
this is somebody with really severe obstructive lung disease, again, very flattened out curve, a very scooped out curve, but a really good bronchodilator response. This is a volume time curve baseline. This is after bronchodilator, and you can see things look much better. This is also a plot on our really old machine that we used to use on total lung capacity, and this is residual volume, and you can see his residual volume is significantly elevated, and that's why his, his vital capacity was low. He's got a lot of air trapping, so he's going to be limited not only by the airflow limitation, but also the air trapping. We like to look at flow volume loops because they'll show things that the volume time curve does not. This is a patient actually of one of my former partners who had severe obstructive lung disease, and this was in 2008. And so it's an old curve. In 2009, he came in with progressive dyspnea. So January 2008, November 2009, um, and he had had a significant loss of lung function. His FEV1 fell from 51% of predicted to 22% of predicted. His chest x-ray was clear. And the question was, why did he lose lung function so quickly? Well, it's interesting. When you look at this flow volume loop, again, a nice peak flow and then scooped out. This flow volume loop, he wasn't able to generate this peak flow. It's kind of almost a straight line across their very truncated appearance. Some of you perhaps have an idea of what may be happening, but this is a CT scan. This is an upper level. This is down in the chest a little bit lower. Even though the chest x-ray was clear, he had a recurrence of cancer nearly blocking off his trachea. And again, the, picked up here just from the flow volume loop saying, boy, he's had a significant change in lung function. He's got this plateauing of the flow volume loop, which suggests central airway obstruction. So rather than just say, oh, this is just COPD, the flow volume loop will say something else is happening here. This is not just a COPD exacerbation. Just to show a few examples of x-rays and additional lung function testing to introduce some kind of imaging. This is somebody who obviously the friendly local neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon has been putting a bunch of hardware in his back probably hyperlucent lungs. He's got an azicus fissure, an interesting incidental finding. You can see this little fissure on the chest x-ray, and hopefully, again, you can see my pointer, but that's an azicus fissure, azicus lobe with no clinical significance. But on the chest x-ray, you say, oh, he's probably got generous lung volumes. The diaphragm's maybe a little flat, maybe a little bit hyperlucent. On the CT scan, here's the azicus fissure, but he's got a lot of hyperlucency here and especially on the coronal view on the CT scan, he's got extensive bullous disease, really huge bulli in both lungs, big floppy air sacs, and so it makes sense the lung's not going to work very well. He also has, he's got some little cystic changes here, which are probably dilated airways that probably have some bronchiectasis, and he probably has some fibrosis in there as well. So um, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Here's somebody else who has very hyperinflated lungs. This is a woman who was in her 50s when, and this chest x-ray was taken, was still smoking cigarettes on a regular basis. I followed her in the office several years and she eventually passed away, but really generous lung volumes. And you can see again, the diaphragms are quite flat here. Uh, so marked hyperinflation and air trapping here. Look at the distance between the aorta and the heart. You know, it's really stretched out here. We're talking about a small vertical heart and the setting of COPD. So kind of what we're seeing there. This is a gentleman who shows nice increased AP diameter uh, and a lot of retrosternal airspace. Again, severe COPD may not show up very well in your screen, but this is very hyperlucent in the upper lungs, um, which is what you see in cigarette smoking. This is a gentleman who's only 40. And look at the lung markings on this right lung versus the left lung. There's almost no lung markings over here. This is an example of what's called congenital hyperlucent or is called hyperlucent lung syndrome or Swire James syndrome, but he basically just a tremendous retrospernal airspace and has destroyed most of this lung with emphysema. Again, significant air limitation on the lung function testing was still smoking when I first started seeing him. Well, the gold guidelines don't really talk much about subtypes these days. Uh, the older guidelines did. Uh, in the ancient times, we used to talk about pink puffers versus blue bloaters, and depending on where you read about COPD, those are still terms you'll see. This gentleman has uh, typical findings of what we'll call a blue bloater. He's a little bit overweight. He's a little bit uh, blue around the gills. Uh, sometimes a bit, uh, uh, often they'll be polycythemic, so sometimes they'll be a little red looking. This guy is a classic pink puffer, often hyperinflated lungs or often thin. And they both have COPD. They're both gonna have airflow limitation on lung function testing, but they behave in different ways. Unfortunately, again, the current guidelines don't really talk about dividing people into subtypes, and it probably should make a difference how we treat them. We just kind of lump all these patients together and kind of try to manage them the same way. We don't manage 
all heart disease the same. You know, we can separate diastolic dysfunction versus systolic dysfunction versus valvular disease, and we manage them in different ways. We don't just say, oh, they've got heart disease. But unfortunately, at this point, for COPD, we kind of lump people together, and I, I hope that we can do better in the future. One of the subtypes that is recognized, not, not talked about by the gold guidelines, is this thing called combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, which is probably that one CT scan that I showed you that had the extensive bolus disease, but some areas of fibrosis as well. It's supposed to be more common in males, often upper lobe emphysema and lower lobe fibrosis. The spirometry in these patients is often better than you expect because the um, um, you know, the fibrosis will actually improve or maintain airflow, in this air, airflow, the emphysema makes it worse. And so oftentimes the spirometry doesn't look as bad as what you might think by looking at the x-ray and they often desaturate. But the reason it's important to recognize this is that it's often associated with pulmonary hypertension, increased risk of lung cancer. And some series have suggested as high as 40%, which is incredibly high incidence of lung cancer. And for Patients who have combined fibrosis and emphysema that get surgery, oftentimes they'll get acute lung injury. So it's probably an important subtype to recognize, but again, not talked about in the gold guidelines. Well, emphysema, we're going to define as an abnormal large of air spaces, distal the terminal bronchioles uh, due to destruction of alveolar walls with little or no fibrosis. And the reason that's in there is people who have pulmonary fibrosis, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, will have big dilated air spaces in the lung. We call it honeycombing that it's not related to destruction of alveolar walls. It's just uh, there's loss of volume in the airways or the air spaces are pulled open. So again, that's a different illness than emphysema. The simplest way to explain emphysema is again, this imbalance between the protease and the protease inhibitors, enzymes that dissolve the lung, enzymes that are supposed to protect against that, but it clearly is more than that. Um, there are subtypes. The central lobular tends to be worse than the upper lobes. If you see lymphedema in the lower lobes, you think about alpha-1 intertrypsin. And certainly we've, we diagnose people with alpha-1 intertrypsin based on the fact that they had emphysema mostly in the lower lobes or bullous emphysema. I've seen some people with really bad bullying in the lung bases that had alpha-1 intertrypsin deficiency. Um, an example, a H and E slide of a normal lung and then emphysema. I like the scanning EM picture. I think I like to explain to patients that normally the lung looks kind of like a sponge with little tiny holes in it. I think many people think of their lungs as being big floppy air sacs that they just pull air in and out of. But again, I try to explain that the lung looks like a sponge. And for people who have emphysema, it looks like a sponge with big holes. Some people like to use the example of Swiss cheese or maybe taking a building full of rooms and tearing down the walls between the rooms. So there are lots of ways that you can explain emphysema. I like the sponge analogy myself, and you can pick and choose. So this alpha-1 and trypsin is an interesting enzyme. It's made by the uh, liver. Uh, it's supposed to be released. Some people make it and don't release it. Some people just don't make it. It's associated with emphysema, liver disease. I don't see much liver disease. Of course, most of my patients have COPD, but the GI people will screen for this in patients who have liver disease of unknown source. I have seen a few patients with liver disease due to alpha-1, but most of the patients I see, of course, as a lung doctor have emphysema. You can get paniculitis or vasculitis. I personally have never seen that. You can uh, also get asthma and uh, bronchiectasis. I've screened a number of my bronchiectasis patients for alpha-1 antitrypsin. and I have yet to pick one up that it's been reported to be associated with those illnesses as well. The most common alleles are M, Z, and S. You're yeah. supposed to have M. Um, the risk with a heterogeneous form is probably low. So most of the patients we see that clinically have trouble are the yeah. uh, uh, homozygotes. I've seen someone who didn't have acutely, but had had it. Like, hmm. Who? Yeah. Like nurse granulomatosis. Oh. Or no, no, okay. I've seen good pastures. That's what I've seen. Was there a question? Sorry. Yeah, where is this? Question. I'm hearing lots of other things. Or do people have questions or not? Or maybe I'm just getting some feedback. Oh well. Anyway, maybe as frequent as one in three thousand live births. Uh, I must admit, in my practice, I've screened a number of patients. I have probably three active patients right now and only one lady on infusion therapy. My oldest patient is in her 80s. Uh, we diagnosed her probably about 10 years ago based on a CT scan. She had another CT scan. She had a CT scan of the chest for another reason. Turns out she had upper lobe emphysema. Checked alpha-1, turns out she was alpha-1 deficient. But she chose not to get replacement therapy. She still traveled a lot uh, and didn't want to be tied down to a weekly infusion. And so 
she elected not to get the infusion. She's lost lung function. Interestingly, you'd think everybody with alpha-1 antitrypsin ought to get emphysema, but not everybody does. And in fact, the majority of patients remain asymptomatic. You can replace it again. It's very expensive, over $100,000 a year. They get expiratory uh, airflow limitation. Diffusing capacity should be reduced. Oftentimes, the blood gases are relatively normal, so the PO2 may be surprisingly good. Um, people say, well, I'm short of breath. I need to be on oxygen. But if their SATs are good, you know, you're not going to get insurance approval for oxygen. Chronic bronchitis uh, is a more of a clinical definition. It's chronic recurrent cough without another cause, so they don't have a lung abscess or tumor or TB, something like that that could cause a cough. Pathologically, you can see increased number of goblet cells and mucous glands. There may be squamous metaplasia, muscle hypertrophy, and then inflammation in the airways. They get inflammation or impairment in inspiratory and expiratory airflow. The elastic recall tends to be more normal. Diffusing capacity tends to be more normal, and they'll tend to present with hypercarbia and hypoxemia. So these are, tend to be the more classic blue bloaters, although pathologically blue bloater versus pink puffer is hard to tell actually. So we like to do spirometry. So the gold guidelines say if you're concerned about COPD, do spirometry. What's their airflow? What's their, well, what's, how, how good is their airflow? Is it actually reduced? And so if you're managing COPD, hopefully have access to spirometry. Uh, it's not that hard to do, but it re requires somebody with an interest in that. So you can't just do it once every six months and hope that you're going to get a good result. So again, we should be testing patients who have uh, symptoms and exposure. There's really not a very good correlation between the FAV1 and symptoms. And so the newer generation of gold guidelines talk about assessing things like uh, degree of symptoms and frequency of exacerbations as being part of the way of separating patients into different categories. But we know that people have increased airflow limitation or an increased risk for exacerbation, hospitalization, and death. And in fact, the best way to predict an exacerbation is if they've had prior exacerbations. Some people just tend to get recurrent exacerbations. So the gold guidelines suggest you should assess symptoms. So cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, you know, or the, how breathless are they, a degree, assess the degree of airflow limitation, how frequently do they have exacerbations, and then look for comorbidities. And I will apologize. I think their current recommendation is overly complex, even for a lung doctor, but you should at least be aware of what people are talking about. So we're going to go through it here quickly, um, how you do that. So again, what kind of symptoms, things like uh, shortness of breath, cough, and sputum production are going to be the classic symptoms. There are ways of assessing symptoms. So there's a thing called a COPD assessment test or the CAT test, and it looks at, uh, we'll kind of look at a CAT test here in just a minute. Um, the, one of the simplest ones is this MMRC or Modified Medical Research Council that assesses the degree of shortness of breath, that all that looks at is shortness of breath. It's not looking at other symptoms. And then there's a COPD clinical questionnaire. So this is what the MMRC looks like. It says, I get breathless only with strenuous exercise or I'm too breathless, I can't even leave the house. The gold guidelines talk about two or greater. So basically, if you have to walk slower than other people of the same age, um, or you have to stop when walking at a normal pace on level ground, that kind of is the splitting point or the dividing point for the COPD guidelines or the or gold guidelines when you talk about classification. So that's kind of what you're looking at as far as the degree of severity. This is the CAT test. We won't go through this in detail, but it basically talks about cough and mucus and I'm afraid about leaving my house. I sleep pretty well. I don't have a lot of energy. And the more score you have, the worse you are. And the, the COPD guidelines or this, uh, the uh, gold guidelines we'll talk about, I think 10 or more as being the cutoff point. So we'll look at those in just a minute here. So we talk about symptoms. We talk about airflow limitation using spirometry. And the numbers to remember for the gold guidelines are 30, 50, and 80. Uh, and we'll, we'll show how that plays a role here. But those are pretty easy to remember. FTV1 is uh, 30, 50, or 80 as the division. So. To define COPD, they say the FAV1 to FEC ratio ought to be less than 70%. Well, it turns out that's probably too high for some patients and too low for other patients, depending on the age of the patient. Uh, so older people, you're going to classify some people as COPD when they probably don't. Younger people, you're going to miss people. But again, their uh, gold guidelines have been criticized, saying the FAV1 to FEC varies with age, height, and sex, just like FAV1, just like vital capacity but they say you have to start somewhere. And so they still use 70% as the recognized cutoff. So post bronchodilator FEV1, if the FEV1 to FPC ratio is less than 70%, we're gonna say they have airflow limitation. 
if the FEV1 is greater than 80, they'll call that mild. If it's 50 to 80, they'll call it moderate. 30 to 50 is severe and less than 30 is very severe. So that's the cutoff for COPD for, it's the way of classifying severity of COPD based on the gold guidelines. Other groups like the American Thoracic Society and some other groups have different cutoffs, but these are what people use. And you'll hear people in the office say, oh, they've got gold three COPD. Airflow limitation used to be the only thing we looked at. If you looked at the older generation of gold guidelines, it was purely based on airflow. But again, we know now that you have to think about more than just airflow limitation. And so now they're talking about assessing frequency of exacerbations or degree, uh, and we talked about degree of symptoms. And so unfortunately what have happened is they've come up with this pretty complex, in my opinion, way of putting people in a box. So we like to put people in boxes. The idea is that they have less symptoms and um, infrequent exacerbations, they'll be an A. If they have frequent symptoms frequent or more severe symptoms, more frequent exacerbations, they'll be a D. And you say, why would I care? Well, the idea is you can perhaps use a box system like this to decide how somebody would, should be managed and also to help you get an idea about what kind of things you might expect. And so again, from less symptoms, uh, infrequent exacerbations to more symptoms and more frequent exacerbations. They used to combine everything and now what they've done is they've split it out. So they'll, they'll grade the severity of airflow limitation based on that 30, 50, 80 like we talked about, and then they'll put them in a box. And so what the gold guidelines would like you to, to sue is say, oh, they have gold three, B or gold three D. I must admit, even for as a lung doctor, I think that's probably over complex. I would rather say they have moderately severe obstructive lung disease and frequent exacerbations. Then it's pretty clear. If I say, oh, they have gold two C, you're gonna sit and think, what does that really mean? So I think if you look through our charts in the office, you'll probably mostly hear us talk, or I will mostly talk about, oh, they've got moderately severe obstructive lung disease. They rarely have exacerbations or, gee, they have frequent exacerbations. I think it's a more clear way to communicate that you should at least be aware of what the gold guidelines are. So the gold guidelines kind of present this case. Here's somebody, they both have an FEV and less than 30% are predicted. So they've both got severe obstructive lung disease. They have a CAT scan of 18, which or a CAT score of 18, which means they're having frequent or more severe symptoms. One had no exacerbations, the other had three exacerbations. One would be gold D, the other would be gold uh, B, 4B. So 4B versus 4D, you say, well, do you really care about which box they're in? And the gold guidelines would make the argument that it might change how you manage them as far as medication. I think it's unnecessarily complex. I show it to you just because, again, when you read about COPD, you're gonna see things like or they have gold 3C. What are they talking about? Well, certainly everybody with COPD ought to work on smoking cessation if possible. And you can use things like Xantix or uh, Zyban, uh, Wellbutrin, behavioral modification, hypnosis. The best thing I think is for people to go cold turkey. It's really hard to taper and stop cigarettes. If you're addicted and you're still getting cigarettes, you're gonna remain addicted. Um, there are some studies that suggest e-cigarettes have been uh, helpful. I personally have not had much success for patients that have switched over. The majority of people I see quit smoking, they use e-cigarettes, and they go back to smoking again. So I, I'm not a big fan of e-cigarettes. I'd recommend that people just smoke or stop smoking. We ask, or we, you know, um, ask, are you still smoking? And sometimes patients are offended and they say, well, I, I told you I was smoking two years ago, but I have a number of people that quit smoking and then they're out with friends or there's a traumatic event in their life and suddenly they're back to smoking a pack a day again. Or if you don't ask, they often won't just say, well, I'm back to smoking. And so I ask even patients that quit smoking some time ago, I'll ask them about smoking. Are they back to it or not? And again, we always tell people to quit smoking. In the old days, you'd have people walk in and say, well, my doctor never told me to quit. Well, that's not true these days. Everybody's heard the message. It's just that they want to hear it. To assess willingness to stop, there's a phone number you can get more than 800 quit now to help them with a smoking cessation. Um, Shantix is available. Again, it's a partial nicotinic receptor antagonist and um, agonist and, and blocker. And nausea, about 30, 50% of patients. And so we often start at a lower dose and advise them to take it with food or drink. Uh, and that seems to help out. We've had a number of successes with Shantix. It costs in the range of 18 to 15, or eight to $15 a day. 
and about 30 to 50 percent of smoker or users will stop smoking, which means again a number of people still continue to smoke with it. But that's probably the best you'll see is with Shantix. Overall, the adult smoking rate in the U.S. is about 14 percent. Interestingly, 10 percent in Utah, about a little over 20 percent in Indiana. This was from I think last year or the year before, which ranks as 45th in the country. So. We still have a lot of work to do in this country as far as a smoking cessation. Again, economic costs a lot uh, and about almost 500,000 deaths per year attributed to smoking. So it's a big cause of death in this U.S. and on average smokers lose about 10 years of life. And so that's a simple thing, a simple thing I think to perhaps motivate your smokers. One of the ways of getting people off cigarettes is to raise that cost of smoking. So this is from January 2020, the New York excise tax was $4.35 a tax, and actually New York City added more tax. So if you're going to be a smoker, don't move to New York City. It's extremely expensive there. Minnesota, about 3 bucks a pack. Virginia, 30 cents a pack, interestingly. Indiana comes in there at about a dollar a pack, and the average was, I think, about a dollar seventy. So we're a little bit off the pace and probably could raise our tax rate here. Um, this is the lung health study that we briefly mentioned. This was published years ago. You say, well, why do we care about a study published so long ago? Well, what they did is thinking one of the things that determines the airflow is cholinergic tone. And so let's give an anticholinergic and see if we can maybe improve airflow. One of the uh, things that's always been looked at, um, or one of the things that's been searched for, I guess, is a way of cutting down the long-term decline in, in lung function with, F, with uh, COPD. How do you keep the lungs from getting worse? And the thought was, well, let's give them an anticholinergic. So this was a study, about 6,000 smokers, and what they did is they randomized them to a smoking cessation program, it was a 10-week program, uh, and then some of the patients got an anticholinergic, and the hope was the anticholinergic would keep the lungs from getting worse, and it turns out there was actually no change from just the smoking cessation. But when they went back and looked at the data, those who continue to smoke cigarettes lose lung function at an accelerated rate. Those who quit smoking had a slight bump, and again, it's a very slight bump in lung function, but then they lost function at a slower rate. So we will tell patients it's never too late to quit smoking, uh, and hopefully what you'll see is maybe not a large improvement in lung function, but at least you won't lose lung function as quickly. And then they published a follow-up study looking years down the road, here's 14-year follow-up, saying, hey, if you quit smoking, there's a significant drop in the death rate from cardiovascular disease, from lung cancer, from uh, coronary heart disease and specific, and from respiratory disease. Interestingly, other diseases or other cancers hmm, didn't really see a drop there. But at least for lung cancer, there's a significant drop in death rate with smoking cessation. Want to attain ideal body weight. Uh, certainly patients and families need to be educated what to expect, want to prevent infection. So the influenza and pneumonia vaccines are both important. We want to treat with exacerbation or treat with antibiotics with exacerbations, so although people would argue about that. Um, antib uh, antibiotics you're going to choose ought to cover strep pneumonia, H flu, and MCAT. And MCAT is a frequent beta lactamase producer. So in the old days, amoxicillin worked, and now that doesn't work as well because of more cataralysis. For more severe airflow imitation, oftentimes they get colonized with gram negatives, and so may need to treat pseudomonas. So when the FEV1 gets less than 35%, gram negatives like pseudomonas are more common. So I have a number of patients in my office who have severe COPD that have recurrent pseudomonas infections. Um, here's a list of the drugs, and you can read about these. Basically, beta agonists come in a short and long-acting version. The anticholinergic is a short and long-acting version. And then there are multiple combination inhalers. Um, I still use methylxanthines like theophylline in the office, uh, not as much as I used to. In the old days, everybody was on theophylline. Now we use it selectively. Inhaled steroids are really not recommended in general, but as part of a combination drug, they are. So basically long-acting beta agonists and steroids are used very widely. You know, Advair came out several years ago. Simbacort's been around forever. And those drugs have been used very frequently for COPD. Now we're kind of hedging or edging more toward a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting muscular antagonist, so lava-lama combination. And then triple therapy. Uh, there's one triple therapy, another one that's coming to market very quickly. Um, and there was a study just published earlier this month called the Ethos trial looking at triple therapy versus combination steroid um, and 
basically two drugs versus three drugs and showing the triple drug therapy works better as far as preventing exacerbations. And so I think there's going to be more of a push toward getting people on triple therapy. Systemic steroids, we try to avoid long-term, and then there's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor um, that we'll talk about briefly. So this is, the, this is the reason that Gold would say you ought to classify people into boxes. And again, I'm not a big box person, but they say, hey, if you've got group A disease, you can just use a bronchodilator as needed. If you've got group D, you can think about triple therapy or a combination therapy. And again, the current push is to avoid the steroids because of side effects if you can and use a llama-lava combination like Stialto, like uh, Anoro, those would be uh, combinations, or like Bovespi, those are all drugs that do not have steroids that would basically be dual bronchodilators, and there's a push to, again, avoid steroids. But the current guidelines say if they got eosinophilia, then you're going to have a, uh, more of a tendency to use a steroid because they're probably going to have an asthmatic component. Uh, reflumolase can be used. I'm not a big fan myself, but it's out there and you'll see people on reflumolase. It has a lot of GI side effects. It's relatively expensive. I'm mostly a theophylline user, but keep in mind reflumolase for those who have frequent exacerbations. There's again, short acting beta agonists or a um, short acting uh, anticholinergic can be used as bronchodilators. Here's a picture of some of those. We have actually a poster that we show people in the office because they'll often come in and say, well, I've got a blue inhaler and a red inhaler. Say, what are their names? And people often don't know. Uh, so we'll show them a picture and say, well, what's it look like? And so we'd like to show pictures of, in, of various inhalers. Again, the anticholinergic atrovin is a short acting one that's been around for years. The long acting version of these by Riva, Tadorza, or Incruz. And there are some combination drugs and there are combinations of LABA and LAMA. So Anora, Stialto, Bevespi are the ones that are typically available right now. Uh, the LAVAs, things like uh, Cerevin has been around forever. Uh, I personally have never used our captor Stravarity, but they're out there as well as long-acting beta agonists. They come as an inhaler and also an aerosol. And you should never use a long-acting beta agonist by itself for asthma. So if somebody has asthma rather than COPD, I would not reach for these drugs because of the danger of sudden death that goes along with those. Again, some more pictures. We're going to skip through those. Bronchodilators. The often is a bronchodilator. We don't really know for sure how it works. It probably relaxes smooth muscle. It may have some anti-inflammatory effect. May improve diaphragmatic contractility. May improve mucociliary clearance. But we know it has lots of toxicity. So nausea, uh, GI side effects, arrhythmias, and even seizures. So back in the old days when we would give the often or aminophilin infusions, if you got the level too high, people would seize. Um, so again, you'll not see the often used as much as it used to be. But I think if you use it carefully, it's still a reasonable drug to use. Reflumolase is called Dalarest. Again, it's a once a day pill, limited by GI side effects. The gold guidelines will say you're not supposed to use it with the often. The company that makes Dalarest says you can use the combination. I tend to avoid that, but you'll see people on both drugs. We know that systemic steroids provide benefit for exacerbations, but really try to avoid long-term steroids if we can because of all the side effects. Um, if somebody has eosinophilia, it makes sense to use an inhaled steroid just like you would for asthma, but most patients with COPD are not gonna be on inhaled steroids by themselves. It's gonna be a steroid bronchodilator combination like Advair, like Symbocort, like Dulera. Uh, and certainly you can prevent exacerbation. So there's a list of some of the steroids and I'm gonna flip through those come quickly because you'll become familiar with the combination inhalers. Um, so when do you decide if you're going to use inhaled steroids? Well, if they've been hospitalized and they've got exacer frequent exacerbations and more eosinophils on a CBC or even a history of asthma, it makes sense to use an inhaled steroid. Uh, if they have repeated pneumonia, one of the risks of inhaled steroids is an increased chance of pneumonia. One of the studies years ago suggested the number of needed to harm was about 50. So for every people, every 50 people you treat with uh, an inhaled steroid, at least one will get pneumonia. It typically doesn't change prognosis but you don't want to cause pneumonia if you can. And certainly if somebody has a mycobacterial infection like amavium, you generally wouldn't want to use inhaled steroids. There's a picture of some of the inhaled steroids and combination drugs. What about oxygen? Typically a PO2 should be less than 55 or 60. May not be needed for exercise desaturation. So for years, if somebody desaturated, desaturated in the office, they dropped the SATs to 85 with walking, but the rumor SATs were fine. We would send them home with oxygen, but actually it's been hard to prove that that really makes a difference. So mostly we're using it now for continuous hypoxemia. Uh, 
we know that if they just use it at night, that doesn't help as much as if they use it all the time. Well, of course, it's harder to use it all the time. If you're out chasing around, it's harder to have auction with you. And so there are a number of portable systems now. It's expensive in the range of four to six hundred dollars per month. I've seen higher costs for that as well. Uh, so it's not something that you want to prescribe unless their auction level is low. Think that they may have heart disease, and so they may have ischemic heart disease or congestive heart failure. Pulmonary rehab is really an important component as well, so getting them referred for exercise and nutritional counseling and education. It's a big social support as well, which helps out to improve quality of life. And then fortunately, we have access now to palliative care, and palliative care is in the heart-lung clinic in our office to hopefully get them involved sooner to help make decisions about uh, end-of-life planning. What's pulmonary rehab involved? Well, endurance training, both upper and lower extremities. Um, there have been some research looking at anabolic agents don't seem to have a benefit. Inspiratory muscle training probably doesn't play a role in most patients, but certainly education is important, and then supplemental oxygen. You can replace alpha-1 and trypsin. Uh, the cost is about 100000 and that's old information. I'll bet it's a lot more than that now, but it's a frequent infusion like every week or two, depending on the level. Um, and I'm going to skip through here real quickly. This uh, surgery used to be done and is still being done on occasion for focal disease. This is a terrible x-ray, but this is a guy who came into the hospital with exacerbation with shorter breath. He couldn't even go to the bathroom anymore, and he had terrible bullets lung disease. This is not uh, pneumothorax. It's actually just a huge bulla. So the surgeon went in and took out that bulla, and when he woke up, he felt better than he had for a long time. And that's really unusual to do thoracic surgery and have people feel better immediately. Uh, I still see him in the office, and this was more than 10 years ago, I think, and he's still doing reasonably well. So want to manage exacerbations, um, and again, it's often infection or perhaps related to irritants. So 30 to 60 percent viral infections, and again, bacterial infections play a role. Often it's a new strain of bacteria. So if they have things like increased volume and change in the color of the sputum, so we ask commonly what color is the sputum, and then people say, oh, it's dark green, or it's white, or it's clear. So if it's clear or white, probably not going to use antibiotics, but if they're going to have a discolored mucus, we'll tend to throw antibiotics on board. Um, and then you have to think about things other than just COPD. So this is an example of a, a lady who was admitted for pneumonia and then she got readmitted. She was released and got readmitted the next day with progressive shortness of breath on her chest x-ray. She's got lots of shadowing in that left lung. Looks like she's got a pneumonia or left lower lobe. And those of you who know me know that I can't see somebody short of breath without looking at the heart. So this is her bedside echo. And for those of you who have not seen echoes, this is a peristone long axis view. This is mitral valve, aortic outflow, right ventricle, left atrium, descending thoracic aorta. This is a pretty bad pump. The back part of the heart, this part of the heart squeezing pretty well, but this part of the heart's not doing much of anything. This is a subcostal view, the base of the heart squeezing, but the apex really isn't working very well. Same thing on an apical floor, the apex is not working very well. So interestingly, not only did she have COPD and pneumonia, she does have pneumonia, but she also probably had a stress myopathy. So she had a cath, had no significant coronary disease, and so this is probably a stress myopathy or like a Takasubos, if you will, in the setting of pneumonia and COPD. She's got some B lines here. She's probably had a little interstitial edema. She does have pneumonia. This is consolidation to the left base, and so hopefully you'll learn more about ultrasound as the year goes on as well. Another example, somebody was admitted to the office with COPD, chronic leg swelling, uh, took a picture of his leg. Here's his femoral artery. This is his femoral vein. And if you've looked at ultrasounds, that's actually a huge clot in his femoral vein. I put a little color on there, and you can see this part of the vein has no flow and a big clot there. And again, that you know, came in with leg swelling and say, oh, it's just coropulmonale. But it turns out it was more than coropulmonale. He actually had DVT and probably had PE as well. You'll see patients use, or you'll see doctors use statin drugs, probably not an, an indication for statin drugs unless they have cardiovascular indication. So basically we use statins if they have a cardiovascular indication, probably not much role to decrease exacerbations. We'll see uh, patients on macrolides sometimes. We think that the macrolides like Zithromax have anti-inflammatory and antibiotic. So studies have looked at azithromycin showing decreased exacerbations. There have been some work with some of the new monoclonal antibodies like methylizumab and bemlurizumab uh, showing exacerbations for patients who have eosinophilia. Those are very expensive drugs as well. Whew, a lot of information. Just to remind you, there's more to life than COPD. So we enjoy sailing. This is sailing on Prairie Creek. 
that's a large sailboat and that we enjoy paddling. And there's the sailboat club on Prairie Creek. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. And again, I'm sorry that we can't really get very good feedback. Anything in the chat boxes that we need to address team? We're yes. okay. Yes, one question. Um, we have an office spirometer. When is it appropriate to do spirometry in the office versus sending the patient for formal PFTs? So when we first see patients, our current policy is we try to do formal to say what are the lung volumes because spirometry, if somebody has a reduced vital capacity, the question is, is that air trapping or do they have restrictive process? You know, maybe they've got kyphoscoliosis, maybe they've got obesity. So the very first time we'll get lung volumes and diffusing capacity and after that I typically follow spirometry. Um, you could justify doing spirometry yearly. I must admit I have some patients that go two years or I have some patients that five years ago had an FEV1 of 20% and I quit checking because patients will say, I don't like to do that test. And honestly, once they're really bad, I don't care if they're 20% or 18% or 16%, I'm gonna manage them the same. So it's hard to beat actually talking to patients and actually asking, how are you doing? And if they say, I'm doing pretty well, I'm pretty happy. And if they say, I'm more short of breath, I'm gonna adjust treatment no matter what the spirometry shows. So I do think spirometry is important, if, especially in making the diagnosis. Um, and then again, every year or two, it's reasonable to follow that and just plain spirometry works fine. Great, thanks. And then uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that the gold 2020 pocket guideline is available as an app. Um, but if you search for it, the only thing that will come up is the 2019. But once you download that, um, there's a link in the 2019 that will update you to the 2020. And again, I think it's good to be aware of, I, I personally think, and I think the other guys in the office will probably say, the classification scheme is probably unnecessarily complex. I mean, that's been written about in the literature as well. And people say, let's just say they've got severe COPD and they have frequent exacerbations rather than say, oh, they've got gold four to C because that's confusing to me, confusing to other people, I think. So it's okay just to talk about things. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think sometimes when we see transfer patients or patients that have been at the med center, we see them classified according to the gold um, stages. So I think it's good that you highlighted everything and went through um, what that actually means. Um, yep. And so it's good for the residents to be familiar with that terminology, but um, I think your point is so valid in terms of actually taking care of the patient. Yeah, communication. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic talk. And then hey, thank you. It's amazing. Yeah. So just to remind you, if you do go to Africa, I, I, things are probably on hold right now. Uh, I assume with travel, are you guys still taking groups? Yeah. I think uh, Kenya is pretty well locked down. Uh, we have some friends that are missionaries there. Um, and I think McKnight just came back from Congo is my understanding. So one of the former residents here as a missionary with her husband in the Congo, and they are back now, I think. Uh, and, are they getting involved with residency again? Is she getting involved, I wonder? Yeah, Daryl, she and Wes, they got an, an, uh, an urgent flight. It was like, my understanding was it was like a last minute, hey, we're yes. playing somewhere and we're gonna fly some missionaries home. And they, were, they had about 40 hours notice to pack and, and board their house up and get ready to go. Uh, but she got back to the States in mid-June, maybe the first or second week of June. And we're hoping about August 17th that she'll be able to start here. She'll be working about two, three days a week. And she's doing this, um, you know, she'll be in this, in the, in the country through about February. And then they're excellent. Good. Yeah. She'll be, uh, I think a really great resource. We, again, we went to Kenya and worked in a, we worked in a Samaritan's first hospital. It's a different place than the residency goes, but this is some of the food. They actually fed us really, really well. My son and I were both surprised we both lost weight in Kenya because uh, we were eating all the time. But I think we just had more uh, naturally sweet stuff. So we had pineapple every day. We had um, mango every day. I'm not much of a mango fan here, but in Kenya, the mango was really, really good. And I must admit, my favorite food was mashed potatoes and bananas. Never had mashed potatoes and bananas. Never thought about putting that together before. But it turns out that is a really good dish. So... <laughs> Okay, I'll quit there. Pardon? You make mashed potatoes and bananas here now? 
Uh, no, my wife is a really good cook and she cooks lots of other stuff. And <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how much banana to put in the mashed potatoes, but there they've got so many bananas, they put them in everything, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks again, that was a great hey, talk. Hey, glad to.